there. Welcome. I'm Holly Camacho here from the Stoughton Area Senior Center. I'm eager to introduce our presenter, Michael Hecht, as he presents an incredible personal journey about the experience of real life Auschwitz survivor, Dita Krauss. Um, he will be referencing two books, The Diary of a Young Girl by Anne Frank and The Librarian of Auschwitz by Ant Antonio Iperbe. Uh, many thanks to Scala Nursing and Rehabilitation Center for generously sponsoring this program. Okay, Michael. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, I'm a Jewish kid from uh, Brooklyn, New York. And over the years, I've had art exhibits um, reflecting the background, my Jewish background. And uh, I was asked years ago at the Wisconsin Vets Museum, um, what triggered my exhibit on the uh, Holocaust? And ever since I was 13 years old, I had a bar mitzvah and I took the role of the cantor at the synagogue for that day. And my back was to the congregation and I was first generation Jew to be bar mitzvah in America and I was reading from our Torah, the Holy Scriptures, and you have to sing. And, you know, I'm a 13 year old kid. My back is to the congregation. Um, I'm going to conduct the service for about two hours out of the three hour service. So it was a lot. Many, very few kids did it. I wanted to uh, prove something that I could do it. Anyway, we had family come in from all over the country uh, for this event. And uh, as I started the uh, program, the bar mitzvah program and started to sing, I was hoping that I was doing everything okay. After a couple of minutes, uh, my voice was joined by these older voices. And what it did is it totally relaxed me because I knew I was okay because they were singing right along with me. And so at the end of uh, the service for that Saturday, um, I got off the altar and my father came over and started to bring me around to people um, that I had never met that was part of our family. And you could say the diaspora because they went all over the world um, either during World War II or after. Um, and many of the people he introduced me to were men. And they all seemed to be about my height, which I realize now as I'm getting older and older, you know, you're shrinking. But what I always remember is they were all wearing either blazers or suits, but they were blazers or suits that they had worn for a very long time. And they were very nice and shiny and worn and they looked even too small for them to be wearing anymore. Anyway, when they came over and introduced, my father would introduce each, each man, they would put out their hand to shake and I would put out my smaller hand and their sleeves would roll up. And when their sleeves rolled up, they had numbers from their wrist to here. I never forgot. Out of all the images for that day that stay with me through day and night. And now 69 years later, I can still talk about it. Um, and that's what really is the genesis uh, for these programs. Also with the diary of Van Frank, and then I'll show you uh, the librarian of Auschwitz. Um, I always felt that large events could always be seen clearer through a personal or a family member rather than to take on the whole large event. And what I found in the last year and a half putting this program together, I've known Diary of Anne Frank many, many years. Um, one of the things I find that if you come back to something you love, maybe come back every five to 10 years, because like I was told by a great mentor, every five to 10 years, you bring another five to 10 years of your own personal living and the great work changes. 
and that could be for painting, film, um, and we do it within our own lives with families and friends. I came across this book, Librarian of Auschwitz. It's a true account. Her name is Dita Krauss. She was 14, the same age as Anne Frank. And basically it becomes almost a sequel or a link because we end with Anne Frank being found with her family. And when we read Dita Krauss, we find out where Anne Frank and her sister Margot went. And so I'd like to read to you some expert excerpts and also talk about a cult of two large cultural icons that through doing these programs, it was fascinating to find out their reflection of my own Jewish background and the Holocaust. So let's begin. And I wanna also preface it by saying um, a large thank you to the staff at the Stoughton Senior Center and to my place of work, uh, the Scholar in Nursing and Rehabilitation Center. I am involved in mankind and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. And that was written by John Dunn. Anne Frank writes in Tales from the Annex, 1944, the true greatness of a person does not lie in riches or power, but in character and goodness. Everyone is human. Everyone has his faults and shortcomings, but everyone is born with a great deal that is good in him. And if one were to begin by encouraging the good instead of smothering it by giving poor people the feeling that they are human beings too, one would not even need money or possessions to do this. Just uh, before I read another excerpt by Anne Frank, what I found going back to the diary of Anne Frank um, is that she becomes, she ages in my personal opinion from a 14 year old girl to a senior girl. Um, and they can only be looked at as you age. Um, when we read the diary of Anne Frank and we're 15 years old, um, we gather it on some level, just as a 15 year old person, our isolation and what they're going through. But when you read it 30 years later, 40 years later, you could really see what makes it also remarkable is this little girl really goes through an aging process in the diary. Anne Frank continues, our freedom was severely restricted by a series of anti-Jewish decrees. Jews were required to wear a yellow star. Jews were required to turn in their bicycles. They were forbidden to use street cars. They were forbidden to ride in cars, even their own. They were required to do their shopping between 3 and 5 p.m. They were required to frequent only Jewish-owned barbershops and beauty parlors. They were forbidden to go out between the hours of 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. They were forbidden to go to theaters, movies, or any entertainment. They were forbidden to use swimming pools, tennis courts, hockey fields, or any other athletic fields. They were forbidden to go rowing, forbidden to take part in any athletic activity in public. They were forbidden to sit in their gardens or those of their friends after 8 p.m. They were forbidden to visit Christians in their homes. They were required to attend Jewish schools. You couldn't do this and you couldn't do that, but life went on. My friend Jacques always said to me, I don't dare do anything anymore because I'm afraid it's not allowed. Before we read from the librarian of Auschwitz, I'd like to take a couple of moments to reflect upon a great icon in American culture and world culture in the arts. And I'm holding up an advertisement for the Wizard of Oz. And I hope everybody can see it. The Wizard of Oz opened up at pre in 1938. And in most people's eyes, 
the concentration camps opened up in 1938. What's remarkable to me as an artist, as a young boy, it's my favorite movie. And what reinforced the artistry about the movie to me was it was all done indoors. Uh, remarkable. It was uh, the size of airplane hangers back then, the studios. And so if you ever get to watch it again, just know that not one piece of film is outside. It's a remarkable achievement, great movie. What's fascinating as the years went is it was the songs and lyrics. The melody and the music was written by Harold Arlen. The lyrics to The Wizard of Oz were written by Y.P. Harbor. They were both two Jewish boys, okay? Um, Y.P. Harbor was asked one time by a reporter, how did you come up with your lyrics? And he kind of said, well, it just came to me one day and I wrote them down on a napkin. And I had known already years and years as, as trying to trigger my own artwork, um, I said, that's a bunch of hooey. Because art, no matter what the medium is, it's like a plant. You put a seed of art in the pot and then you water it with your own personal experiences and your world experiences. I think one of the things that doesn't get communicated in our education is that we look upon a single piece of artwork and we don't look at the times and the people and the experiences that probably brought this artwork into being. And it's the same for The Wizard of Oz. The great song, Over the Rainbow, is a melancholy song, even the way Judy Garland sings it. It's a melancholy song. I want you to just think about the movie. I'm sure all of us have seen it at least one time. It starts off in black and white. And of course, Dorothy doesn't want to live there. She wants to get out, see the world and do all kinds of things. Doesn't want to be told what to do. She's a teenager. Um, the original, girl asked to be Dorothy was Shirley Temple. But the director, the owner of the studio said, no, we need an older girl. And that's how Judy Garland got the part. So it's black and white, it's Kansas, a terrific tornado comes, disrupts a whole world. It's black and white. And let's think of that world as the world of Eastern Europe, as the world of the Nazi controlled countries. It's no longer safe and good for people of Jewish heritage. And that's the black and white. So Dorothy goes off, the house goes up, it comes down and all of a sudden the movie is in color. And she lands in a land where the flowers are beautiful, they're giant. The people come out at first, they might be shy, but they come out, they're friendly. She meets Glinda, everything is good. And we could look at that as a metaphor and we could look at that colorful land that she lands in as America. And then we come to one of the central points of the movie. What does Dorothy have to do? She's told to follow a certain road. And if we look at Y.P. Harbor, and Harold Arlen, growing up Jewish, coming to America. The Jews that made it to America as the Nazis were gaining power in Germany, they started to write letters back. Uh, my own family, my father's family came from Poland and they were snuck into the country of America. That's for another time, but what happens is the letters are going back and forth between the Jewish families in America and the Jewish families in Germany, Holland, wherever, Poland. And they write, you must find a way to come to America. There's no programs. There's no Nazis. We can work. We can walk the streets. There's no rules for Jews. 
it, you can get any job you want here. And one of the lines in many of the letters were the streets are paved with gold. We go back to the Wizard of Oz and Y.P. Harburg and Harold Allen. They get the letters from Eastern Europe and the countries that are coming under siege of the Nazis. And they send, like I said, uh, streets are paved with gold. And so what do the characters in the Wizard of Oz, which has nothing to do with the original book, so what are the characters in the film? What do they tell Dorothy to do? Follow the yellow brick road. Um, you can't get any plainer than that as far as gold. And let's look at the great song, Over the Rainbow. And let me read it to you. Um, it's a great poem. And I look upon all the great songs by Irving Berlin and Cole Porter. They're also great poetry. Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I've heard of once in a lullaby. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue, and the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. Someday I'll wish upon a star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me, where troubles melt like lemon drops, high above the chimney tops. That's where you'll find me. Somewhere over the rainbow, bluebirds fly, Birds fly over the rainbow. Why then, oh, why can't I? If happy little blue birds fly beyond the rainbow, why, oh, why can't I? Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I've heard of once in a lullaby. Somewhere over the rainbow, skies are blue, and the dreams that you dare to dream really do come true. Someday I'll wish. Again, the lyrics by Y.P. Harburg. And we'll make our jump to the librarian of Auschwitz. And here's an excerpt. Inspection, inspection. Inspections are another matter altogether. Lines must be formed and searches are carried out. Sometimes the youngest children are interrogated. The guards hoping to take advantage of their innocence to pry information out of them. They are unsuccessful. Even the youngest children understand more than their snot-covered little faces might suggest. Someone whispers, a priest, and a murmur of dismay breaks out. That's their name for one of the SS non-commissioned officers, a sergeant who always walks with his hands tucked into the sleeves of his military greatcoat as if he were a priest, though the only religion he practices is cruelty. Come on, come on, Judah. Yes, you say. Say I spy. And what do I spy, Mr. Stein? Anything, for heaven's sake, child, anything. Two teachers look up in anguish. They are holding something that's absolutely forbidden in Auschwitz. These items so dangerous that their mere possession is a death sentence, cannot be fired, nor do they have a sharp point, a blade, or a heavy end. These items, which the relentless guards of the Reich feel so much, are nothing more than books, old, unbound, with missing pages, and in tatter. The Nazis ban them. They hunt them down. Dieter Krauss was asked by the head teacher, and they ran a school within Auschwitz, kind of like a publicity um, if the outside world came to see what they were doing at the camp, they would automatically bring him to this school. Um, and of course, it was ramshackle, but it was a school. And uh, they had about six, eight books. And Dita Krauss was asked if she wanted to be the caretaker for these books. If the books were found on her, it was a death sentence. She knew it. She's 14. And she told the head teacher, I'll take the responsibility of caring for these books. And therefore you get the librarian of Auschwitz. Here's a telling, she tells the author Antonio Iturbe about their travels from the ghetto. It was after they'd been traveling from the Terrazin ghetto for three days, cramped into a freight car without food or water. Night had fallen by the time they re reached Auschwitz-Birkenau. It was impossible to forget the screeching sound 
of the metal doors had opened. Impossible to forget that first breath of icy air that smelled of burnt flesh. Impossible to forget the intense glare of the lights in the night. The platform was lit up like an operating room. Then came the orders, the thud of rifle butts against the side of the metal carriage, the shots, the whistles, the screams. And in the middle of all the confusion, that Beethoven symphony being flawlessly whistled by a captain of the Reich at whom even the SS guards looked with terror. That day at the station, the officer passed close to Dita and she saw his impeccable uniform, his spotless white gloves and the iron cross on the front of his military jacket, the medal that could be won only on the battlefield. He stopped in front of a group of mothers and children and patted one of the children in a friendly manner with his gloved hand. He even smiled. He pointed to a pair of 14-year-old twins, Zedanek and Yurka, and a corporal hurried to remove them from the line. Their mother grabbed the guard by the bottom of his jacket and fell on her knees, begging him not to take them away. The captain calmly intervened. No one will treat them like Uncle Osip, and in a sense, that was true. No one in Auschwitz touched the hair of sets of twins that Dr. Joseph Mengele collected for his experiments. So Dr. Joseph Mengele did his work within the Auschwitz um, camp. I'd like to bring us back now to Diary of Anne Frank and have these two girls, their experiences going back and forth a little bit. Anne Frank writes, when she and I were sitting in our bedroom, Margot told me that the call up was not for father, but for her. At the second shock, I began to cry. Margot is 16. Apparently they want to send girls her age away on their own. But thank goodness she won't be going. Mother had said so herself, which must be what father had meant when he talked to me about our going into hiding. Hiding, where would we hide? In the city, in the country? In a house, in a shack? When, where, how? These were questions I wasn't allowed to ask, but they still kept running through my mind. Margot and I started packing our most important belongings into a school bag. The first thing I stuck in was this diary and then curlers, handkerchiefs, school books, a comb and some letters. Preoccupied by the thought of going into hiding, I stuck the craziest things in the bag, but I'm not sorry. Memories mean more to me than dresses. 14 year old girl writing that. What uh, you might find fascinating is if you go on and you Google, I am not allowed to use a cell phone by my family because I put it in the laundry too many times. So I'm a dinosaur with technology, but I've become a Google master. If you put Anne Frank on film and Google it, Unbeknownst to them, many years ago, uh, there was a wedding outside a building in uh, Amsterdam. And the cameraman was filming the young couple on the street and his camera went to wandering around the view and he pointed his camera up the building. And there were two young girls looking out this way, uh, their window looking down at the wedding. And the two young girls now, our Anne Frank and her sister Margot. It only lasts for about 30 seconds, but it's remarkable just to see uh, the two small girls looking out. I wanted to talk about another icon. Um, I love comic books. I basically became a reader through Classics Illustrated and paying a dime for a comic book. And um, one of the comic books I read was Superman and uh, DC Comics and all that. And again, going through and looking at the creation of Superman, it was done by two Jewish boys again in Cleveland, Ohio, Joel Schuster and Jerry Siegel. They were in high school. And they both, when interviewed years later after the success of Superman, they were asked, how did you come up with Superman? 
And they both said, well, we were what you would call nerds. We didn't know how to get girls in high school. So we figured we'd write about this superhero that wouldn't get sand kicked in his face. And he would beat up all the bullies and, and big monsters and, and bad people and villains. And so we created, one could draw and the other could write. Jerry Siegel could write, Joel Schuster could draw. And they began to put together this comic book. Unfortunately, if you look at it and Google it, the history for those two men involved in Superman was all tied up in litigation um, because they never got their due monetarily. But they live on though in literature through their Superman. But again, revisiting as an older person and looking at it through the years in the last 20, 25 years looking at it, I said, what is it about Superman? Where did they come up with Superman? There has to be something else. And then it came to me as I was reading some of the Jewish folk legends, I came across the golem, G-O-L-E-M. And if you've never heard about the folk legend or if you heard a little bit about it. I remember the TV program, The X-Files did a, a kind of their own production on the Golem. But the Golem was this. In the programs when the Cossacks would attack the villages in Russia, in Poland, Romania, the rabbi of that particular village would go down by a river or a lake, anywhere where there was water. And he'd go down to the sandy beach and he would conduct a prayer and ritual. And as he put out his prayers, out of the sand would come up this giant man made of sand. Uh, we're talking eight feet and four feet wide and just a huge man. And then the rabbi would come and on the forehead of this giant sand man, he would write E-M-E-T-H. And at that point, this sand would come alive as a human, a giant Goliath, so to speak. And the rabbi would tell him to go out and protect a certain town from the program. The golem would go out, defeat the Cossacks, save the town, and come back after he this was accomplished. And the rabbi would come back and he would meet the golem and he would erase one of the letters because he met, meant to bring life. And if he erased one of the letters, it would bring death. And at that point, upon erasing one of the letters, the sand would go back to the sand on the beach. 25 years ago, it dawned on me that Joel Schuster and Jerry Siegel, because all art again is your experiences, you filter it away, and when the time comes, that seed of art becomes a flower, whether it's over the rainbow, whether it's follow the yellow brick road, it comes, you're watered by the letters telling the streets are paved with gold. And the same, in my opinion, for Superman. Because basically what Superman is, written by two Jewish men, is a golem. And the only difference is the golem has a cape. The Librarian of Auschwitz. 300 more this morning, just in the second crematorium. Most of them were women and children. Shlomo pauses and looks at them. He wonders if you really can explain the inexplicable. He waves his hand in the air and looks up at the sky, but it's overcast. I had to help a little girl take off her shoes because her mother was holding a baby and they have to go into the chamber naked. She kept poking her tongue out at me playfully as I was taking off her sandals. She would have been less than four. And don't they suspect anything? May God forgive me. They've just arrived after spending three days traveling in a freight car. They're stunned, frightened. An SS guard with a machine gun tells them they're going to have a shower and they believe him. What else would they think? 
The guards get them to hang their clothes on hooks and even tell them to take note of the number of the hook so they can retrieve their clothes afterward. That's how they make them believe they'll be coming back. The guards even insist they tie their shoelaces together so they won't lose their shoes. That way it's easier to gather up all the shoes later on and take them to the hut we call Canada, where they pick out the best articles of clothing to send to Germany. The Germans make use of everything. And you can't warn them, Rudy jumps in. May God forgive me. No, I don't warn them. What would it stop? There are at least two to 300 people per session. And that's just in our crematorium. Sometimes there's one daytime session. Other times there's two. Sometimes the ovens can't cope with the number of bodies. And they tell us to take the corpses to a clearing in the forest. We load them up in a small truck and then we have to unload them again. And do you bury them? That would require too many work squads. They don't want that. May God forgive me. The corpses are sprayed with gasoline and burned. Then the ashes are shoveled onto a truck. I think they use them as fertilizer. The hip bones are too large to burn properly, so they have to be crushed. My God, whispers Rudy. In case anyone hasn't realized it, says Shomaisky sternly, that is Auschwitz-Birkenau. Wednesday, January 13th, 1943. Dearest Kitty, and what's beautiful about Anne Frank is her first page of a diary. She received it as a birthday present. She says, it's not going to be just any old diary and any old writing. It's going to be a friend. And she calls her diary Kitty. Terrible things are happening outside. At any time of night and day, poor, helpless people are being dragged out of their homes. They're allowed to take only a knapsack and a little cash with them. And even then, they're robbed of these possessions on the way. Families are torn apart. Men, women, and children are separated. Children come home from school to find that their parents have disappeared. Women return from shopping to find their houses sealed, their families bond. The Christians in Holland are also living in fear because their sons are being sent to Germany. Everyone is scared. Every night, hundreds of planes pass over Holland on their way to German cities to sow their bombs on German soil. Every hour, hundreds or maybe even thousands of people are being killed in Russia and Africa. No one can keep out of the conflict. The entire world is at war, and even though the Allies are doing better, the end is nowhere in sight. As for us, we're quite fortunate, luckier than millions of people. It's quiet and safe here, and we're using our money to buy food. We're so selfish that we talk about after the war and look forward to new clothes and shoes, when actually we should be saving every penny to help others when the war is over, to salvage wherever we can. The children in this neighborhood run around in thin shirts and wooden shoes. They have no coats, no socks, no caps, and no one to help them, gnawing on a carrot to still their hunger pains. They walk from their cold houses through cold streets to an even colder classroom. Things have gotten so bad in Holland that hordes of children stop passerbys in the streets to beg for a piece of bread. I could spend hours telling you about the suffering the war has brought, but I'd only make it myself more miserable. All I can do is wait as calmly as possible for it to end. Jews and Christians alike are waiting. The whole world is waiting, and many are waiting for death. Yours, Anne. One of the things I've learned over the years coming back to Holocaust programs uh, was an article written by Seymour Hirsch. And uh, he basically wrote, the title was, Why Did We Bomb the Railway Lines? And it's a noted historical fact that he wrote in his article that the Allies knew the locations of the concentration camps. They knew the location of the railway lines that led into the camps, but we never bombed them. 
We never bombed the railway lines to slow up uh, the slaughter of the Jews and gypsies and supporters and people anti-Nazis against it. So I found that unbelievably remarkable and at the same time, very depressing to find that out. Dieter Krauss in Librarian again. In the morning, another round of face washing in the metal troughs and the immodest lowering of underwear and hiking of dresses to perform bodily functions along with 300 other people. Then the painfully slow head count on another freezing day. The cold ground turns their clogs into shoes of ice. The guards leave the camp, their list dotted with crosses beside the name of those who have not survived the night. Finally, Fred Hirsch closes the barrack door and raises an eyebrow. The children raucously break ranks and go to their stools. A few teachers stop by the library and a new day begins in block 31. Dita heads outside to escape the feeling of oppression in the barrack. Night seems suddenly to have returned. My God, what is it? Someone asks. It's God's curse. It's daytime now in the camp. Dita looks up and her face, hands, and dress are spotted with tiny gray flakes that disintegrate between her fingers. The inhabitants of Block 31 come outside to see what's going on. They can no longer see the sun. What's happening, asks a frightened little girl. Don't be afraid, says Miriam Edelstein to the children. It's our friends from the September transport. They're returning. Children and teachers crowd together in silence. Many of them quietly pray. Dita cups her hand so she can catch some of that rain of souls, unable to hold back her tears, which form white furrows down her blackened face. Miriam Edelstein is hugging her son, Aria, and Dita joins them. The smoke, of course, from the crematorium is raining down on the people still surviving in the camp. Um, a personal story in relation to that, I went out to visit my good uncle Louie in California. I was about 18. Um, and uh, I would speak my mind, unfortunately, too many times. And I was, now I'm just an old hippie. But back then, I thought I knew everything. But um, he was a beautiful man. He said to me, while you're here for these weeks, would you like to be my apprentice? He was a butcher in one of their supermarkets. He said, the only thing I'm going to ask you, Michael, there's a woman uh, from Germany who now works in our supermarket. She works in my department, um, she uh, feels very strongly that the Holocaust never happened. So I said, Uncle Louis, it's not my place. I'm not going to say anything. And I said, I just come and have a good time with you working and so on. So one night we're working after a couple of weeks there and Unfortunately, the topic of the Holocaust comes up and I don't know how it came up, but the woman starts talking about it, not happening and all that. And my beautiful uncle Louie, I look at him and he looks at me and he gives me the nod, giving me the okay if I want to respond. And she is talking about living close to a, a concentration camp and it was never a camp. We never saw anything. We don't know. We didn't know anything about it. And I walked over to this woman who was who meant well, had a family, a good lady. And I just looked at her and I said, but you had to smell it. And I walked away and uh, I left with my Uncle Louis that day. And uh, it just reinforces that it's important for the world to always hear the story. And um, I've always told people that for me, if you ask me, Michael, if you told me to read a book before you read Anne Frank or after you read Anne Frank and The Librarian, what would you read? And I would tell them to read Sophie's Choice by William Styron. 
It's a beautifully written book. The film is just as good. It's a great film. Um, Meryl Streep plays the central character. Um, in fact, she plays a Christian affected greatly by the Holocaust. And the reason I love Sophie's Choice is very personal, takes a large, massive event, brings it down. Um, and the other thing about it, it, it has a sense of being very, very real. Uh, although Schindler's List is a great movie about a great man and, and what he accomplished, I just found it personally very clean and I was always separated from it with the film, where Sophie's Choice, I felt I was watching real people that I met um, in the street. So Dieter is the librarian of Auschwitz, and this excerpt comes, she's in the school. Dieter become, makes an effort to help fall down the tips of the girl's spoons on a stone. Those whose spoons are done Use them to sharpen the ends of splinters of wood into points. Sometimes the splinters have knots in them and can't be used. At other times, the point snaps off and the process begins again. After a tiring hour's work, the girls have splinters with sharp tips. Then Miriam carefully sets fire to some wood shavings in a saucepan and scorches the ends of the splinters. Each splinter becomes a crude, sooty pencil with which the children can write three or four words. Paper is a scarce commodity, and Lichtenstern acquires it a scrap at a time by telling the Nazis he has to prepare lists. Pretty remarkable. My own story, also living in Queens, I remember, is coming into a candy store in the neighborhood knew me and I knew the candy store owner and everything was, you know, neighborhood wise. And um, as I walked in to get my morning coffee, um, the candy store owner, I think if I remember is Sal and he looks at me and he says, Michael, come here for a minute. And he looks at this other gentleman who lived in the area or maybe not and says to the gentleman, you know what you were saying about Jews? Why don't you repeat it? Because Michael's of Jewish heritage. I'm sure he'd love to hear it. And I'm still to this day always amazed um, about that. And uh, so it's, you know, I always say this is a land of immigrants and the only people that actually are here are the Native Americans. All the rest of us came here. I want to continue with Anne Frank. There's something happening every day. This morning, Mr. Van Hoven was arrested. He was hiding two Jews in his house. It's a heavy blow for us, not only because those poor Jews are once again balancing on the edge of an abyss, but also because it's terrible for Mr. Van Hoven. The world's been turned upside down. The most decent people are being sent to concentration camps, prisons, and lonely cells, while the lowest of the low rule over young and old, rich and poor. One gets caught for black marketing, another for hiding Jews or other unfortunate souls. Unless you're a Nazi, you don't know what's going to happen to you from day to the next. Friday, May 26, 1944, my dearest Kitty, long, long last, I could sit quietly at my table before the crack in the window frame and write you everything, everything I want to say. I feel more miserable than I have in months. Even after the break-in, I didn't feel so utterly broken inside and out. On the one hand, there's news about Mr. Vohaven, the Jewish question, which is discussed in detail by everyone in the house. The invasion, which is so long in coming, the awful food, the tension, the miserable atmosphere, my disappointment in Peter. On the other hand, there's Bep's engagement, the Pentecost reception, the flowers, Mr. Kugler's birthday, cakes and stories about cabarets, movies and concert. 
that gap, that enormous gap is always there. One day we're laughing at the comical side of life and hiding, and the next day, and there are many such days, we're frightened and the fear, tension, and despair can be read on our faces. I was fortunate enough to visit the hiding place of Anne Frank and her family, and you actually enter the building and you go behind a, a bookcase and you go up the steps. What's very poignant about the area where Anne Frank slept in is on the side of the wall of her bed are all these images of Hollywood stars that the little girl collected from magazines that were snuck in by friends who knew where they were hiding and they would bring them Anne Frank Hollywood magazines and she'd cut them out and paste them on her wall. And I'd like to read you our last excerpt from the Librarian of Auschwitz. A few rows from their bunk, two actual sisters ill with typhus are already losing the game of life. Just take a drink of water. I'm gonna repeat that again. A few rows from their bunk, two actual sisters ill with typhus are already losing the game of life. The youngest sister, Anne, is shaking with fever in a bunk. The elder, Margot, is even worse. She's lying immobile in the lower bunk, connected to the world by a wisp of breath that is fading. If Dita had gone over to look at the girl who was still alive, she would have discovered that they were very similar, teenagers with a sweet smile, dark hair, and the eyes of dreamers. Like Dita, Anne was an energetic and talkative girl, a bit of a rebel and with an imagination. She was also a girl who apart from her unruly and self-assured appearance, had a reflexive and melancholy inner voice. But that was her secret. The two sisters had arrived in Bergen-Belsen in October, 1944, after they'd been deported from Amsterdam to Auschwitz. Their crime, being Jewish. Five months have been too many to avoid death in this wet hole. Typhus has no respect for youth. Anne dies alone in a bunk the day after her sister. Her remains will stay buried forever in Bergen-Belsen's mass graves. But Anne has done something that will end up being a small miracle. Her memory and her sister's memory will bring them back to life many years later. In the secret place in Amsterdam where the two girls and their family hid, she spent two years writing notes about her life in the house at the back. Some rooms attached to her father's office, which were closed off and converted into a hiding place. For two years, with the help of family friends who supplied provisions, the family lived there together with the Van Pels family and Fritz Pfeiffer. Shortly after they moved into their hideout, they celebrated Anne's birthday, and among the presents was a small notebook. Since she couldn't have a close friend in the hideout with whom she could share her feelings, she shared them with that notebook, which she christened Kitty. It didn't occur to her to give a title to this outline of her life in the house at the back, but posterity took care of that. It has become part of history as the diary of Anne Frank. And that young girl writes, one day this terrible war will be over. The time will come when we will be people again and not just Jews. Who has inflicted this on us? Who has set us apart from all the rest? Who has put us through such suffering? It's God who has made us the way we are, but it's also God who will lift us up again. In the eyes of the world, we're doomed. But if after all this suffering, there are still Jews left, the Jewish people will be held up as an example. Who knows, maybe our religion will teach the world and all the people in it about goodness. And that's the reason, the only reason we have to suffer. We can never be just Dutch or just English or whatever. We will always be Jews as well. And we will have to keep on being Jews, but then we'll want to be. 
Be brave. Let's remember our duty and perform it without complaint. There will be a way out. God has never deserted our people. Through the ages, Jews have had to suffer, but through the ages, they've gone on living, and the centuries of suffering have only made them stronger. The weak shall fall, and the strong shall survive and not be defeated. That night, I really thought I was going to die. I waited for the police, and I was ready for death like a soldier on a battlefield. I'd gladly have given my life for my country. But now, now that I've been spared, my first wish after the war is to become a Dutch citizen. I love the Dutch. I love this country. I love the language and I wanna work here. And even if I have to write to the queen herself, I won't give up until I've reached my goal. I wanted to close our program today. And again, thank you to the Stoughton Senior Center and to the Scotland Nursing Home. I want to close our program with this great poem. It's called Sympathy by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. I know what the cage bird feels, alas, when the sun is bright on the upland slopes, when the wind stirs soft through the springing grass and the river flows like a stream of glass, when the first bird sings and the first bud opens, and the faint perfume from its chalice steals, I know what the cage bird feels. I know why the cage bird beats his wing till its blood is red on the cruel bars, for he must fly back to his perch and cling when he fain would be on the bow a swing. And a pain still throbs in the old, old scars, and they pulse again with a keener sting. I know why he beats his wing. I know why the cage bird sings, ah me, when his wing is bruised and his bosom sore, when he beats his bars and he would be free. It is not a carol of joy or glee, but a prayer that he sends from his heart's deep core, but a plea that upward to heaven he flings, I know why the cage bird sings. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>